Hello, my name is Austin Habish, the founder of Think Catholic, and you're listening to the Summa in Year podcast, where we study St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae in a way simple and insightful for anyone to understand. The Summa in Year podcast is brought to you by Think Catholic. Taking two questions of the Summa a day, we'll seek to summarize St. Thomas's responses, discovering the brilliance of Aquinas and his Catholic faith this is day 70. So let's get started. We're covering today questions 18 and 19 of the Prima Secundae, that is, of the good and evil of human acts in general, and of the goodness and malice of the interior act of the will. The translation that I always use in these podcasts is the one generously provided to me by Ave Maria Press, the five-volume set translated by the fathers of the English Dominican province, which you can now get at a discounted price from Ave Maria Press's site by typing in the code SUMA10. And so here we go. And we have no less than 22 articles to cover in this episode, so to keep it within our usual time, we'll have to move quite swiftly. And so here we go. Article 1, whether every human action is good, or are there evil actions? Since evil is a privation, as we mentioned in episode 25, a lacking of the goodness or being that is proper to a thing, like blindness in the man, such would be an example of physical evil, so too with moral evils, the general principle is the same. A human action which is lacking in its proper goodness, whether in regard to its object, circumstances, or intended end, is an evil action. And in the following articles, we will look at each one of these factors and how actions can become good or evil. Article 2. Whether the good or evil of a man's action is derived from its object. What is the object of a man's action? It is, according to Aquinas, as translated in the Gilby Summa, the material with which an act deals. It gives the specific nature to an act. Another commentator on Aquinas will say, the object is the action's subject matter, the act in itself. So, for example, murder or almsgiving. Taking the life of an innocent person is an essentially bad action. Giving food or money to those who are in need is an essentially good action, and they derive their moral character, at least in the abstract, from the kind of act that they are. So in response to this article, Aquinas writes, just as the primary goodness of a natural thing is derived from its form, which gives it its species, so the primary goodness of a moral action is derived from its suitable object. However, since the intended end and circumstances can affect the moral character of an action, we must inquire into those as well, which leads us to our next article, Article 3, Whether Man's Action is Good or Evil from a Circumstance. What is a circumstance? St. Thomas says, That which stands around, or circumstant in the Latin, an action as being outside it. So similar to how a man has a substantial form, his soul informing the matter of his body, but also other qualities or quantities that are in or on him, where can be found privations like blindness in the eyes, so too moral evil can be found in actions by what surrounds the object of those actions. And these are certain circumstances. For example, like eating meat for dinner, which as the object of one's action does not in itself seem necessarily good or evil, unless, of course, the man eating the meat is a Catholic and it is Friday during Lent. The circumstances, time, and place have altered, then, the moral character of his action. In this way, circumstance can make a man's actions good or evil. Article 4, whether a human action is good or evil from its end. St. Thomas writes, And thus it may happen that an action which is good in its species or in its circumstances is ordained to an evil end or vice versa. So since deficiency or privation in human action is precisely what makes it evil, and because deficiency can be found in action not only according to its object and surrounding circumstances, but also in its intended end, the end can also be a source of good or evil in actions. For example, when a man gives to the poor, but for the sake of being praised by others. What could have been a morally praiseworthy action by its object and its circumstances has now been tarnished by its intended end. As our Lord said, concerning almsgiving specifically, beware of practicing your piety before men in order to be seen by them. 
for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Article 5. Whether a human action is good or evil in its species, the species or kind an action is, some particular act, is derived primarily from its object, what the action is about, and since right reason is the rule or measure for morally good or evil actions, insofar as the object of this action falls from or is in accord with the right reason, so too it is said to be good or evil. As Aquinas says, an action is said to be evil in its species, not because it has no object at all, but because it has an object in disaccord with reason, for instance, to appropriate another's property. So taking theft as an example, as the object of a man's action, being against right reason, so too it is considered evil in its species or kind. Article 6, whether an action has its species of good or evil from its end, Going back to our example of almsgiving for the sake of vainglory or the praise of men, we noticed how the intended end made what would have otherwise been a good action, considered abstractly, an actually evil action. And so, yes, an action can receive the aspect of good or evil from its intended end. In St. Thomas's words, Now, in a voluntary action, there is a twofold action the interior action of the will and the external action. And each of these actions has its object. The end is properly the object of the interior act of the will, while the object of the external action is that on which the action is brought to bear. Therefore, just as the external action takes its species from the object on which it bears, so the interior act of the will takes its species from the end, as from its own proper object. And it's worth mentioning that some actions, irrespective of their intended end, are evil in themselves based on the thing done, like adultery or blasphemy, which can never be done for a right reason or under the right circumstances. Article 7, whether the species derived from the end is contained under the species derived from the object as under its genus or conversely. This article is asking how the previous two articles work together. Is the specific difference of the end contained under the broader category of the object? Or is the category of the end have within it specific differences of objects? Kind of like asking, is man the rational animal contained within the category of animal or within the category of rational? And to avoid making this question impossibly complicated, Aquinas says, we say that he that commits theft for the sake of adultery is guilty of a twofold malice in one action. So in this case, the end for the sake of adultery and the object, theft, are just considered separately and not with one being within the category of the other. But if the two, object and end, converge, such as when a man commits theft for the sake of being rich, it would presumably be the more particular of the two which gives the action its species, which in this case would be theft, not greed. Article 8. Whether any action is indifferent in its species, is any action morally neutral? in its kind. And although there are actions like adultery, which is morally evil, and honoring one's parents, which is morally good, based on the kinds of actions they are, there are also actions like picking up a piece of straw, to use St. Thomas's example, which is considered merely in its kind, morally neutral. However, as actually done by us, as intentionally willed or voluntary, No action is morally neutral. It must be good or evil, even picking up a piece of straw, which we discuss in greater detail in our next article. Article 9, whether an individual action can be indifferent. To quote St. Thomas, he says, Gregory says in a homily, an idle word is one that lacks either the usefulness or rectitude or the motive of just necessity or pious utility. But an idle word is evil. Because as our Lord said, men shall render an account of it in the day of judgment. 
while if it does not lack the motive of just necessity or pious utility, it is good. Therefore, every word is either good or bad. For the same reason, every other action is either good or bad. Therefore, no individual action is indifferent. In brief, everything that man does, as proceeding from deliberate choice, not like a mindless scratching of the beard or shaking one's leg, must either be in accord with right reason or not. And if that accordance or discordance with right reason does not stem simply from the kind of action it is, like adultery, which is always not in accord with right reason, then it will stem from the actions surrounding circumstances or intended end. In other words, in response to our article, no individual human deliberately voluntary action can be morally indifferent. Article 10, whether a circumstance places a moral action in the species of good or evil. Circumstances can be considered as something merely surrounding a certain object, like the person, place, or time involved in a man's theft. However, in some cases, the circumstances can actually define the species of an action, such as when someone steals, but steals specifically a chalice from a particular cathedral, making what might have only been an act of theft because of these circumstances, specifically an act of sacrilege. Or to use Aquinas' example, the circumstance of taking what belongs specifically to another places that action as one morally evil. In his words, thus to appropriate another's property is specified by reason of the property being another's. And in this respect, it is placed in the species of theft. And so in this manner, circumstances can place a moral action in the species of good or evil. Article 11, whether every circumstance that makes an action better or worse places a moral action in a species of good or evil. Circumstances by making an act in accord or not in accord with reason in some specific way can specify the action, like we mentioned about theft. But if circumstances do not affect the general accord or discord of the action with right reason, they will not be said to specify the action or give it its species, whether good or evil, it will only aggravate or increase, decrease the already constituted good or evil of this action. For example, the act of theft under the circumstance of larger or smaller amounts being stolen. This circumstance does not change the kind of act as an evil one, but only increases or decreases in an additional way the good or evil found in it. And now on to question 19 of the goodness and malice of the interior act of the will. Article 1, whether the goodness of the will depends on the object. What we mean by goodness of the will here is a will directed to the true good, as opposed to only an apparent good. A will directed to the good in accord with right reason. Because there is a sense in which the will is always directed to the good in general. It always wills goods, but it does not always will the right good or appropriate good as determined by right reason. Which is why when Aquinas talks about a good act of the will, he writes, insofar as it, the good in question, is in accord with reason, it enters the moral order and causes moral goodness in the act of the will. And since, as we have mentioned, the goodness or evil of an action is derived primarily from its object, from what the action is about, then we can say in response to this article that goodness of the will in regard to some action does depend on the object of that action. Article 2, whether the goodness of the will depends on the object alone. And the relevant considerations of a moral action are the following three, the object, the circumstances, and the end. And since the end is in some ways included in the object itself, since we do not act without some end in mind, in St. Thomas's words, the end is the object of the will. Hence, in regard to the act of the will, the goodness derived from the object does not differ from that which is derived from the end. So then speaking to the circumstances specifically, Aquinas will say, an action does not take its species from the circumstances as such. And then later in the article, he'll write, the circumstances are accidents 
as it were, of the act. So circumstances, if considered only as circumstances, are only the non-essential conditions surrounding the action and not part of the essential definition of that action and therefore do not alter the species of that action, as we already mentioned. Article 3, whether the goodness of the will depends on reason, absolutely, because it is reason which distinguishes the true good from the apparent good from the right good to be willed and the good which ought not to be willed. As St. Thomas writes, Hilary says, It is an unruly will that persists in its desires in opposition to reason, but the goodness of the will consists in not being unruly. Therefore, the goodness of the will depends on its being subject to reason. Article 4, whether the goodness of the will depends on the eternal law, and it does insofar as the natural law or the law of right and wrong is known by our natural powers of reason is ultimately founded upon the eternal law. Moreover, insofar as God has revealed supernatural laws to us corresponding to our supernatural end, also in this way, the goodness of our will depends upon conformity to the eternal law. In Aquinas' words, it is from the eternal law, which is the divine reason, that human reason is the rule of the human will, from which the human will derives its goodness. It is therefore evident that the goodness of the human will depends on the eternal law much more than on human reason. And when human reason fails, we must have recourse to the eternal reason. Article 5. Whether the will is evil when it is at variance with erring reason. In other words, is the will evil when it wills against what reason takes to be the true good, even when reason is wrong. So for the man who thinks he ought to worship idols on Saturday, if he does not, in fact, worship idols on a Saturday, is that action for him an evil action? And to answer the question, it helps to begin by rephrasing our article, according to Aquinas' own words, who says, to inquire whether the will is evil when it is at variance with erring reason is the same as to inquire whether an erring conscience binds. And so does an erring, incorrect conscience still morally bind us? And the answer is yes, because conscience is our own judgment of the moral character of some action either which we have done or are about to do. And when we sincerely take something to be the right thing to do, we ought to do that thing. Even if at the end of the day or years later, we look back and realize we probably should have done something differently. Now, whether or not that mistaken judgment excuses our moral action or not will be the topic of a later article, but for the sake of this article, we must say that since any action at variance with reason is evil, then even when our reason is incorrect, variance with it makes for evil, as St. Thomas says. Hence, Aristotle says that, properly speaking, the incontinent man is one who does not follow right reason. But accidentally, he is also one who does not follow false reason. We must therefore conclude that, absolutely speaking, every will at variance with reason, whether right or erring, is always evil. Article 6, whether the will is good when it abides by erring reason. Aquinas rephrasing this question writes, The previous question was the same as inquiring whether an erring conscience binds, So this question is the same as inquiring whether an erring conscience excuses. And that depends on what kind of ignorance we are talking about, as we discussed in episode 64 of this podcast. If the ignorance is intentional or caused by some disordered passion or vice, then erring conscience is not excusable. But if the ignorance is truly through no fault of one's own, like a man taking a billfold off the table, which he truly thought was his own, although it was actually someone else's, then this kind of ignorance would excuse what would otherwise be considered morally evil as theft. And St. Thomas's words, if the error arises from ignorance of some circumstance and without any negligence, so that it causes the act to be involuntary, then that error of reason or conscience excuses the will that abides by that erring reason from being evil.
And lastly, to give an example from Scripture, it seems like this was the kind of ignorance which St. Paul claimed for himself when he persecuted the church before his conversion, as he wrote in 1 Timothy, I thank him who has given me strength for this, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful by appointing me to his service, though I formally blaspheme and persecuted and insulted him, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Article 7, whether the goodness of the will as regards the means depends on the intention of the end. And as we stated already, if we consider the intended end as the cause of the thing willed, for example, vainglory as the end for which someone is giving alms, then the end gives an action, which might have been good, considered as almsgiving, the quality of something evil. But if the end is something, as it were, outside of the action, like serving as a witness to one's Christian brothers or as a means to the conversion of the Gentiles, along with the primary intended end of martyrdom, which is obedience to Christ, then in this way, those other subsequent intended ends would not determine the goodness of the will and the act of martyrdom. As St. Thomas says, intention that follows the act of the will is added to a preceding act of the will. And then the goodness of the previous act of the will does not depend on the subsequent intention, except insofar as that act is repeated with the subsequent intention. Article 8, whether the degree of goodness or malice in the will depends on the degree of good or evil in the intention. Is the goodness or evil in the will equivalent to the good or evil in one's intention? And we know this is not the case. Although a bad intention can make what could have been otherwise a morally good action, like almsgiving, morally evil by the intention of vain glory, it cannot make what is an evil in itself, like killing the innocent or blasphemy or adultery, a somehow morally good action. And we could say much more, but I'll refer the listener to the text if one is interested in the details of this article. Article 9, whether the goodness of the will depends on its conformity to the divine will. In a word from St. Thomas, human knowledge is conformed to the divine knowledge insofar as it knows truth, and human action is conformed to the divine insofar as it is becoming to the agent, and this by way of imitation. So, insofar as our will is like God's will, who wills goodness perfectly and immutably, then our will can be said to be good. And insofar as our will follows truth, which is also God by definition, he is truth in his essence, insofar as we know the truth, either supernaturally or naturally, by willing in accord with right reason, our will is also said to be good. Article 10, whether it is necessary for the human will in order to be good, to be conformed to the divine will as regards the thing willed. Our compass in this question is the following from Aquinas. In order that a man will some particular good with a right will, he must will that particular good materially and the divine and universal good formally. What that means is that we must will some particular good, but only insofar as it is in subordination or aligned with the universal good, which is God, God's will. For example, if a man wanted to fast for God's glory, but his religious superior of some religious order he happens to be a part of, like the Dominicans, tells him not to fast, then in this case, the morally good thing to do would be to forego that particular good of fasting for the sake of the universal good, which is obedience to God's will through his religious superior. And therefore, the thing willed must be in conformity with God's will in order to be good, because particular pursued goods must find their place within the broader picture in order to be in accord with right reason. And that big picture is the universal good and law of right reason, which is God himself. In St. Thomas's words, In order that a man will some particular good with a right will, he must will that particular good materially and the divine and universal good formally. Therefore, the human will is bound to be conformed to the divine will as to that which is willed formally, for it is bound to will the divine and universal good, but not as to that which is willed materially. Now, one might object that God's will is not always clear to us at every moment, so conformity to God's will is not something that can be rightly demanded of us. 
But one could respond to that objection that there is the natural law and the eternal law as revealed by God, which we have been given to prescribe right reason in regard to our actions. Thus, in however way we happen to understand that most universal good, the end or goal of all things, which is God, God's will, we must be conformed to it in things we will in order for our will to be good. And that brings us to a close of questions 18 and 19 of the Prima Secunde, that is, of the good and evil of human acts in general, and of the goodness and malice of the interior act of the will. My name is Austin Habish with Think Catholic, and I cannot wait to see you tomorrow.